curious, doctor, how common is it that maybe the man is infertile and not the woman? And what would be the options there? And then I'm going to reverse that question after you answer this question. Well, um, in the past, Olga, it was estimated years, years back, even when I started doing my fellowship, that about 25% to 30% of the causes of infertility were male factor uh, derived. Um, as the years have gone by and as recent as now, uh, it is estimated that about 50% uh, of patients who have infertility have male factor and the other 50% is related to the female. Um, it's just uh, um, something that we attribute to many different factors, including the uh, possibility that women are uh, delaying their childbearing ages to, uh, like in your case, uh, Olga, at age 35. In the past, years back, like my parents, they began having children when they were 18, 19, 20, 20. And nowadays, that's not a common occurrence. So that definitely can lead to infertility as well. And that's something that I was going to follow up on because it's, it's, I've talked about this with my mother and in her time as well, um, 20, 21, they were having children and it didn't seem like there was, and maybe I'm wrong, doctor, but it didn't seem like th this was prevalent, shall we say it that way? Mm -hmm. And yet yeah. it's more common today. Do we know why? I think that the, the most important thing is that delay of childbearing. This is what we all know. Delay in childbearing to the later ages. We see patients in our office, in our practice. Um, probably the largest volume is between age 35 and 40, not before. So that is... That, yeah, absolutely. So uh, the volume of patients, I mean, being be in their 20s is very, very low, very definitely very low. The vast majority of patients are definitely over age 30. It doesn't have to be over 35, but I would say probably over 30. And, um, and that definitely is an important, very important factor in, um, in the onset of, uh, of infertility because those women are beginning to have a decline in their ovarian reserve. That's a very important concept that uh, we will be talking. I'm sure you're going to ask me some questions about it. Uh, and that, and that uh, decline in the ovarian reserve is directly associated with, uh, with uh, infertility. Mm -hmm. And let's in, talk about in, uh, that decline in the reserve. Let's talk a little bit more yes. about that because it's important yes. to know it, it happens. Yes, uh, as, as women age, as you see, all the eggs that they have from birth, they decline progressively. And then by certain age, usually in, in their late 40s, those numbers are minimal, uh, almost non-existent. And of course, hormones have begun to decline as well, but the number of eggs, which is the most important factor, uh, decline and deteriorate also genetically. And that's the reason why women in their older uh, age, reproductive age, have an increased incidence of miscarriages uh, due to chromosomal abnormalities. So that's a definitely important factor to keep in mind. And doctor, I have more questions and definitely options, which I want to get to. But before we do, let me just remind our viewers, if you have a question for our expert, all you have to do is send in that question or give us a call. There's the email questions at allhealthtv.com or give us a call 855-796-4475. We would love to hear from you. All right. So doctor, let's talk about when a woman is infertile. There are so many options today. There is so much hope. So let's Let's basically break it down because I know this is going to take a little bit of time right now. I started just so you know with Clomid and maybe you could tell our viewers what that is. And I was successful with it. Thank you, Lord. Um, but there are other things Lord. after that as well. Okay. And, and like you said, Olga, you started with Clomid. And the reason why you started with Clomid is because you did have some ovulatory issues. In general, Clomid uh, is not used as a first choice if your ovulation is normal and you do have another factor that is causing infertility. So first we start with uh, checking on ovulatory function. So we make sure that the patient is uh, releasing an egg every month um, and making sure through all the testing that we have available by blood work as well as with ultrasound sonograms and we can determine the size of the egg and then we know that the patient is indeed ovulatory there are some home tests that can be done i'm sure you are aware of as well that we ask the patients to follow on in order to enhance the uh, the diagnostic capabilities 
Uh, following that, if the patient does show some evidence of lack of ovulation, then we start, of course, with the oral medication like you took, and that was successful in your case. It's successful in many, many patients. Um, and then depending on the response on that drug, then we have other ovulatory medications that we use. Some of the other medications are injectable, which are, uh, you know, specific in our, in our field. They're very delicate to use and uh, because they may lead to complications. But when, when it's used safely, like in our hands, they are very, very effective. Um, and obviously the last step beyond that and the uh, Trying, and a patient trying to conceive, then we, of course, have in vitro, which is the most sophisticated at this point in time method uh, to employ to uh, uh, help patients in achieve a pregnancy. Uh, we can expand on that depending on what you, you want to know or the patients want to know or the, or the viewers want to know. Well, speaking of the viewers, and thank you, doctor, for that transition, I do have one from Mary. It's a video question, so let's listen to what she has to say real quick, doctor. Hi, doctor. My name is Mary. I am uh, currently pregnant with my first child uh, as the result of multiple rounds of IVF. While we wait for this little one to arrive in August, my husband and I are already trying to think about uh, giving him a sibling. We have a couple embryos in, in storage currently. I'm wondering what the best process would be to, to grow my family even more. Should we automatically just go to a frozen embryo transplant a couple months after the baby's birth, or should we try to uh, conceive naturally? Uh, full disclosure, conceiving naturally did, is something that didn't work for us. I'm just wondering what your thoughts are to grow our family. Oh, thank you, Mary. Well, first of all, congratulations to Mary. Oh, that's so wonderful. Congratulations, it's great. You look great. And I'm glad that you asked that question because that has a very many different answers. So you, you seem to be a very young woman, despite the fact that you went through several cycles according to your, to your explanation of IVF. But you seem to be a young woman and um, I wouldn't go immediately into uh, using your embryos because you want to give your body a little rest. And, and the recommendation now by the American College of OBGYN, the American Society for Reproductive Medicine, is to wait at least somewhere close to a year, a, le a year and a half, uh, to space your, uh, your family, your children. But um, if you have already your embryos that are in storage, then in, in Hopefully they have been tested uh, genetically. Uh, I see no reason why you cannot uh, use those embryos. That's why you did IVF and you have excess embryos. A lot of couples don't have that, uh, that benefit. So if you have excess embryos, I would definitely use them um, unless you have a problem or you have a situation that puts you at risk of not being able to have children later on. But if you are otherwise healthy, and there are no problems uh, uh, otherwise. I think transferring a single embryo, we propose always a single embryo, not multiple, because you want to avoid the possibility of a multiple pregnancy, which is, of course, not uh, healthy and can lead to complications, much more complications than a single time. So definitely uh, use your embryos uh, in a reasonable way. Uh, and I'm sure that because of your young age, that you should be able to conceive again.